I studied filmmaking in the US during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We'll continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Today I will interview Mama E.D. Armstrong, Afro-American artist and bilingual storyteller, a great woman who participated in the Arba'in gathering two years ago. We will talk about her experience. Please watch the show. Mama E.D. Armstrong is an African and Native American artist who received her Bachelor of Science degree in 1973 in speech-language pathology from Northern Illinois University in DeKalb and her MHS degree in communication disorders from Governor State University in University Park, Illinois in 1989. Fun and Frolicky or Sumber and Serene International bilingual storyteller and percussionist Mama Edie guides audiences through words and songs on journeys to find peace, power, and joy within. Seamlessly blending stories in Spanish and English, she welcomes audiences to broaden their imaginations, to create the world they would rather see, to embrace its multicultural richness, and love it. Her stories are largely inspired by her passionate regard for her African and Native American ancestries. In 2007, she authored an article entitled How to Reach a Multilingual Audience for a book edited by Margaret Reed MacDonald. The book is named Tell the World – Storytelling Across Language Barriers. Mama Edie has published original stories and has been featured on PBS and two award-winning storytelling DVDs. She was awarded a National Storytelling Network grant and a Racebridges Fellowship for her residency, What About the Children? Encouraging refugee children to tell their own stories. Mama Edie's personal, historical and folk tales encourage self-knowledge and empowerment, learning to see the light in everyone and daring all to make a difference. Traveling the world, she shares interactive stories and songs that capture the heart. In 2017, Mama Edi took part in the Arba'in Walk and experienced a new world which had an impact on her life. My greetings to you, uh, dear Mama Edie. So good to see you again after uh, a couple of years. And um, uh, I wish you health and uh, prosperity in all that you're doing. Let me begin. My first question is your trip to Iraq in, in Arba'in, in retrospect. Uh, what has that left you with that you had not experienced before as uh, an artist? As an, it has actually impacted me on many different levels. Um, first of all, simply as a person, as a human being, um, because it was, it was so overwhelming. Uh, just some of the things that impacted me most had to do with just the presence of so many people. I had never experienced quite that many people before, and I, I remember it was estimated that that year was roughly about 40 million people, uh, if memory serves me correctly, and to simply be in the midst of that many people who were all there to honor Imam Hussein uh, and all that that means was, it was enormous. It was very, very enormous. And 
it's kind of hard, I guess, for me to separate myself as a person and as an artist because they're so closely entwined. And it seems that most of the experiences that I have, I end up finding ways to mm, to storyize them, <laughs> if you will, and uh, to be able to take the experience of being at Arbaim and to relay that story, not as a once upon a time kind of thing, but as a, oh my goodness, let me tell you what happened to me in Iraq. It has been an amazing thing, so it doesn't really take much to develop a story based upon that experience. And, and among the things that uh, really impressed me, uh, that stayed with me, was the sense of family that I felt. It, it reminded me of the first time that I went to Africa, to uh, West Africa, and I felt an unmistakable sense of being back home in a place where I had never been, and I felt that there. And as we were, so that made me feel comfortable. And then we felt so protected and so loved and people coming up to us, you know, on the street and who are you and asking the question over and over again, so why are you here? And so to ask myself, in fact, there was a friend in Chicago before I left and she said, so Edie, I heard that you're going somewhere. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to Iraq. She said, girl, why are you going to Iraq? And I said, well, I'm going to a peace conference. I was invited to a peace conference. And she said, girl, you can do that on Skype. <laughs> so, uh, but <clears throat> I could not have felt that sense of family on Skype. I could not have smelled the dusty roads and, and um, been so moved by so many of the experiences on Skype. I had to be there. Right. Um, your, your experience as a storyteller in two languages and the fact that you stress so much on words and the effect of words um, mm -hmm. um, and you heard all these slogans, these chants as you walked with the flags uh, blowing in the wind with those thousands and thousands of people as you were marching. We thought that uh, it would be interesting when American artists and we had some hip-hop artists that were mm -hmm. there, Afro-American hip-hop artists. We thought, right, how, would, right. how would an Afro-American artist take the story of uh, Arba'in and this uh, very unabashed expression of passion? Um, did that work for you? Actually, it did work for me because, primarily because a lot of the work that I do is related to matters of peace and social justice. So even if I'm telling a folk tale and a story that is lighthearted, um, many of those stories, I can take them and they can be used <clears throat> to make a statement or to support um, a thought or inspire people to action uh, relative to matters of peace and social justice. So to be able to storyize some of my experiences in, uh, at Arbaim has been a wonderful thing. For example, in terms of specifically using the power of words, there was uh, one of the first um, meals that we shared there. I saw a couple of people who were from Ecuador and Bolivia, three people from uh, Ecuador and Bolivia, and they were kind of standing off to the side looking like, well, who can we talk to? Because they only spoke Spanish. And um, I speak a bit of Spanish. And so I, I didn't know a soul there, you know. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I went over there to make them more comfortable. And I said, you know, habla en español. And they were like, oh, my goodness, thank goodness somebody speaks Spanish. Well, we ended up becoming very, very close. And then one of your videographers, uh, Ali, who basically spoke Farsi, and I speak no Farsi, we decided we were going to sit down and share a meal together. And so here they are speaking only Spanish. Here's Ali speaking Farsi, and here's me, you know, <laughs> it's stuck in the middle. <clears throat> so we're having these conversations. And so they're asking, the Spanish speakers are saying, Mama Edie, 
ask him such and such and such. And I'm saying, okay, they want to know such and such and blah, say, blah. And then he says, okay, Mama Edie, ask them. So I'm like, okay, di okay, so and so and so. So I'm going back and forth having this crash course in translation. But what stood out to me about that experience was that it didn't matter that we spoke different languages because we cared to connect. We cared to communicate. And I think that that's important. It's, it's crucial because we don't have to allow our languages or our cultures or anything else to get in the way of our coming together. All we have to do is care enough to try and it'll work. And so we started calling ourselves La Familia, <laughs> the family. Okay. You know, um, I, from, from your experience, I know that when you were 15, you had another very important walk that stood out in history yes. with Martin Luther King in Chicago. Yes. Um, yes. Tell us about your, your activism goes way back. You had a conscience that, uh, uh, that uh, pushed you towards activism and standing up mm -hmm. for, um, mm -hmm. for rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about how that walk, uh, in a way, extends to this walk, which is a, is a very strategic walk. Absolutely. It's interesting that it, it as I look back in retrospect, my walking days uh, began when I was even younger than that. My mother Christine McLeod um, had rheumatoid arthritis, a very severe form of it, and so she could not walk. I was the youngest of four children, and I had never actually seen her walk unaided, maybe with a cane or a crutch when I was about four. However, even though she lived most of her life from that bed, uh, from the years that I knew of her, um, when there were issues in the community that needed to be addressed, she would have me write up a letter or would have me uh, develop a, um, a form where I would have to, she would send me up and down the street to get signatures so that we could get the alderman to take action on certain things. She also had been connected when she was young um, with aldermen and people who were doing things to empower the people. And so that she had me doing those kinds of things when I was about 12 years old. So when I had that march with Dr. King, which was very impactful, um, this was, I wrote a story about that experience called The First Time I Looked Into the Face of Hate. I'd never seen hate before. I didn't know what that looked like. And when people were coming up and cursing at me and spitting at me and my my family did not curse that if they cursed outside the house i never knew about it but there was no cursing that happened in my home and so at you know as a teenager this was all very new to me and being accosted simply because of my culture and because of who i was and and what i looked like and um and it was very violent it was very violent and so when i was invited to uh, come to Iraq for Arba'in, I remember saying to myself, hmm, here I am walking again. And um, it was definitely very much connected. And when people would ask the question, okay, so why are you here? I, and I had asked, I, well, first I said, you know, well, I was invited, you know, to participate in this conference, but as I walked, I asked myself, not only why am I here, but why are all these people here? Why are so many people willing to come and walk 50 miles for some more, for some as much as a week, to just walk all the way to get to the shrine of Imam Hussein? Why are they walking? What do they hope to achieve? What's being accomplished by simply walking down the street? But it was such a full experience because when I think about who Imam Hussein was and what his life meant and that he stood for justice and he was an example of patience, of tenacity, of determination and perseverance and internal strength and fortitude and clearly 
if you're going to decide you're going to walk for 50 miles <laughs> and you're surrounded by people it's for me it was an it was it was an exercise in patience and tenacity and determination and strength and it was also a wonderful opportunity for meditative reflection as people would walk along and and talk with each other uh, talking about different kinds of things and so it was a great opportunity to talk about where we were in our circumstances socio-politically even spiritually and what kinds of things did we see possible that we could do in order to lift ourselves and each other up and so I'm grateful to say that um, many of uh, the connections that I made uh, at Arbaim uh, are still continuing on today on some level or another we are supporting each other's efforts in our respective countries and so to participate in that conference was a catalyst it was a springboard from which other efforts could take place that would encourage and inspire people to stand up for justice no matter where they happen to be. So, and, and I did get a chance to um, march again um, after Dr. King, that, that march was in an area of Chicago on the southwest side called Marquette Park. And Chicago having had the reputation of being the most segregated city in the country, um, they're trying to get out of that uh, now and it's not as segregated anymore but um, that was an area that was on the way to Midway Airport and the only time black folks went down those streets was if we were going to Midway Airport because we might go over there and might not make it back and this is not ancient history we're talking about the 50s the 60s the 70s and the 80s as well and so what happened was that there's an organization that is actually housed now. There are several cultures now in Marquette Park, but there's an organization there now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, called IMAN, and I M A N, and it stands for Inner City Muslim Action Network. And so this is an organization that has collaborated with different groups from different spiritualities. They have Jews that they're working with, they have Christians. They have a variety of different people that they're working with. Um, and they do a, a wide variety of different activities. They are, they are, um, how shall I say, they, they look for, they are watchdogs, if you will, uh, for different kinds of issues that are taking place that need to be addressed. And then they gather people together so that they can be addressed. And so in 2016, they hosted a 50th year uh, commemorative march in Marquette Park, where I marched to in, in 1996. And they invited um, the people, many of the people that they could find who participated in that first march to come back and march again. And so I did. And that was an amazing experience to be back in that place where I had known such hate and to march among people that were filled with so much love and hope and, um, and determination. And there's a friend by the name of Sue O'Halloran who is a wonderful storyteller and has committed her entire 30 year plus um, experience as a storyteller to exploring and, um, uh, and performing around matters of peace and social justice. Sue lived in one of those redlining communities and we're the same age. There's no way that her parents would have allowed her to march with me when we were both teenagers. But I contacted Imam and I said, you've got to invite my friend Sue, this little redheaded Irish girl. And I said, she's got to march with me this time. So Sue called me up, Edie, guess what? I got the call, I got the call. And she said, they've invited me to march. And so, so we met up and we saw each other. We're hugging and everything, had our little flags, <laughs> you know, our little uh, liberation flags and what have you. And me and my friend Sue were able to march together 50 years after that horrific experience in Marquette Park. And it was good. You know, uh, one of the interesting highlights of the trip was uh, they made a portrait documentary about you 
while you were there in Iraq. T tell me about that experience. How did you connect with the filmmaker and the experience of being recorded and then put together that film, which I think uh, was a pretty good job? First of all, <clears throat> the connection that I had with those young men, <laughs> they, I feel like they're all my sons now. <laughs> and <clears throat> we developed a very close bond. And so I, they were so protective and so loving. I was having a few physical challenges that they would, if, if they thought that um, a, a passage was going to be too difficult, they made me sit in a wheelchair. I'm like, I don't want to sit in a wheelchair. Come on, Mama Evie, come on, you've got to. So they were very, very protective. And when we finally, uh, that the experience of them walking in front of me with the cameras, <laughs> that was something that was different. I had never, I mean, I'd been videotaped and televised before and all that kind of thing, but I had never had an experience with cameras all over the place. And <clears throat> initially, it um, initially it was novel, and um, and I was focused on them because it was it was actually a little bit of a distractor. But then after a while, I became accustomed to them being there, and I simply allowed myself to begin to observe the people in the places and the interactions that I saw among different people, and. Um, so the the young brothers they were there and then they kind of weren't there but but they were always warm and loving and one of the things that was actually one of the experiences that had me going into what are these people thinking about as they're walking down these roads and so i think that because i removed myself from the presence of the cameras and simply allowed myself to internalize the bigger experience that was taking place, it gave rise to some very, very deep emotions. And um, by the time we finally made our way up to the television studio uh, for the interview, from which we looked, <clears throat> we were able to see over the balcony into directly over to the shrine of Hussein. I didn't know what I was going to see when I got up there. I'm just going up this dark little stairway and they're like, okay, be careful. Watch your step, watch your step. And when we get up to the top, I look up and there's this, these golden domes and um, these towers and it was so beautiful every time i think about it i want to cry and that was two years ago you think I'd, I'd be done but it was so overwhelmingly beautiful and i suppose that it was partly so moving not because of just its physical beauty but i had just been experiencing the beauty of the entire experience of being and part of Arbaim, this was simply a physical manifestation of all the beauty, of all the love, of all the pain even, of all the hope. That was the reason why that structure had been erected in the first place, to give people a chance, to give them the opportunity to come back, to re-embrace, to rekindle that spirit that Imam Hussein had shared with so many and to recommit to continue to live that life, those principles, uh, those values and beliefs that he that he taught. So um, and and then when so when the um, when the young men were uh, doing the video the videography and what have you, I it it didn't matter to me at the time that they were standing up there with I didn't even know where they were at that moment when I saw the shrine nobody else was there nobody else was there i just kind of went into went into another zone and um and they had stopped asking me questions for a while because i couldn't speak all i could do was stand there and cry and it took me a while 
to get myself back together again. And I know that I thought about all the pain that my people have been through. Yes, sir. Have been through for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the kinds of experiences that people globally, globally have experienced because there are people among cultures who just never, they, they're like, to me, they're like overgrown adolescents and they never learn the concept of enough. Just take and take and take and more and more and more by any means necessary. And, and it's so unnecessary to live that way. You know, there's enough of everything for everybody, but we have to be grown-ups, and we have to know how to share and we have to know how to care, and then it would all be all right. And there's plenty for everybody. We can still be wealthy. We don't have to have everything. And so it remains important that we have experiences like Arbaim so that people can be reminded of the pain, but also of the triumph of spirit and that we need to pass that on in any way that we can. So if I can continue to pass that on, through stories, through my songs, through poetry, through conversations. And that's one thing that we have to do more with each other. You know, I hear so many people saying that they didn't know such and such about a certain culture. I said, well, have you ever tried to have a conversation with anybody from that culture? Well, no, now that you mention it. I, you know, so we just need to talk to each other and don't allow anything, not language, not color, not nationality, don't let anything get in the way of what we can achieve as a human family. Uh, Mommy, uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to conclude uh, the talk. I know it's early morning now where you are and, and you had to go to a meeting after this. I uh, thank you. And uh, as, uh, as we're speaking, uh, the Arba'in is going on. You see the, the, the huge throngs of people, uh, even more, more populated than the year that you were there. Uh, all feeling the same passion, the same uh, very strong uh, expression of, of passion and emotion about an event that took place uh, over a thousand years ago, but has stayed in history. And uh, for, yes. uh, for, some, for some spiritual divine reason, it has withstood history. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes. yes, so thank you so much. And uh, it's a good thing that now we have a documentary about you in which we will broadcast right after this interview that I'm having with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and they, that was a very, very nice piece that was done. And, uh, and thank you so much. For I was floored. I didn't realize anything like that was going to be developed just with my story. I was like, oh my gosh, look. <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy to have been able to contribute, and, and I hope that my presence made a difference to the overall success of the sure. experience. It and sure thank did. you again. Thank you again for that experience. It was wonderful. Yes. God bless you. Take care. God, God, God bless, bless you as well. Okay. Peace. Okay. okay. Peace. Peace. Hope you have enjoyed the interview with Mama Edie, so stay with us.